<laughs> Great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Hakan Topal. I'm an artist and assistant professor at SUNY Purchase College. I'm one of the organizers of the conference, and I have been an active member of Gezi New York City platform since we started our protest at Zuccotti Park together with <coughs> our Occupy Wall Street friends. I think most of us would agree that it has been an incredible summer. People all around the world, including those from Turkey, Brazil, Greece, and Bulgaria, rose up against the neoliberal economic policies, privatization of their commons, and defended their democratic rights. Although all of these local contexts are different from each other, the demands were comparable. One of the most interesting aspects of these uprisings is that the protesters informed each other, creatively appropriated strategies to create an inclusive political space where new forms of temporal social engagements were made possible. Protesters sent messages across the globe through banners, flags, tweets, Facebook posts, and all of which underlined the, a new form of international solidarity. For example, at the beginning of Gezi protest in New York City, together with our Greek friends, we staged a one-of-a-kind solidarity event where Greeks, Turks, Kurds, Americans form an exceptional sense of solidarity. A week later, a similar protest was organized in coordination with Occupy Wall Street, Brazilian, Greek, and Turkish solidarity. These gathering, gatherings provided more than a simple stage for collective action. We developed new action networks, got to know each other. We spoke about our issues, our similarities, and differences. In fact, Occupy Moments revealed that there can be a different kind of politics, which is interactive, inclusive, energetic, welcoming, decentralized, and creative. Perhaps the idea is not to provide direct answers to social, political, or economic issues but rather to show that there are new social possibilities that transcend current repressive political systems. In fact, demands of democracy, economic equality, political participation, and cultural recognition in varying degrees are similar. But before jumping into a big conclusion, I think we need to question the particularities of these movements and their significance in a global context. Therefore, in this panel, we will actively seek to answer some fundamental questions about the form and nature of these contemporary political movements. How do they differ from their historical counterparts? How do they employ unprecedented amounts of creative production in their activities? Perhaps it is a new patriotism as part of affectionate politics defined by love for each other and for their commons. The politics of small things are actually as important as larger social political issues. Now it's my great pleasure to be here this afternoon at the Occupy Solidarity and Global Consequences panel discussion with our distinguished guests. I would like to introduce all our panelists in, the, in order of their presentations. First, uh, my former colleague from the New School, Despina Lalaki. Despina is a lecturer at the AS Onassis program in Hellenic Studies, New York University. Lalaki studied archaeology and art history at the University of Athens, history and art theory at Binghamton University, and sociology at the New School for Social Research. Her doctoral dissertation was titled Digging for Democracy in Greece, Intracivilizational Processes During the American Century. Then Michael Hart. Michael Hart is the chair of the literature program at Duke University, his recent writings deal primarily with the political, legal, economic, and social aspects of globalization. In his book, books with Antonio Negri, Declaration, and the Empire Trilogy, he, uh, he has analyzed the functioning of the current global stru power structure, as well as the possible political and economic alternatives to that structure based on new institutions of shared commonwealth. 
Michael kindly accepted our invitation and came from North Carolina. And for this, we, we are especially grateful. He will be in Turkey as a resident scholar at Boston University next year. Finally, Jeffrey Goldfarb, who does not need an introduction at the New School. Jeffrey is the professor of sociology at the New School for Social Research. He's the author of dozens of articles and eight books, including Civility and Subversion, the Intellectual in Democratic Society, which provides the theoretical guidelines for the practices of his blog, Deliberately Considered. He has studied historically and comparatively the conditions and consequences of free public life with special focus on Central Europe and North America. In recent years, he has studied this problem in Israel and Palestine. For his public and intellectual work in Central Europe, Goldfarb was awarded the Solidarity Medal uh, from the Polish government. And finally, Lucky Tran is going to be the respondent tonight and uh, from Occupy Wall Street. Uh, Lucky is a a scientist, activist, and creative who has lived, studied, and worked in Australia, the UK, and the US. Over the last two years, he has participated in the Occupy movement as an organizer, media maker, and an artist. He is also involved with the visual artist collectives, the Illuminator, and not an alternative. Thank you very much, and Despina. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is on. Uh, yes. Okay. So uh, apparently I was uh, invited to talk uh, not explicitly about Turkey, uh, but uh, as an outsider, as uh, looking at Turkey uh, from across, from across the Aegean, and also report a little bit on what is happening in Greece. So trying to think how to, to start talking about those two countries, long, long history in place, often very, very contested, I couldn't help thinking about nationalism. So on the other side, however, the Gezi Park events and the mass mobilizations in Greece against authoritarianism, the encroachment on uh, civil liberties and labor rights, the rampant privatizations, and the inroads of neoliberalism, more generally, followed by numerous then symbolic gestures of solidarity and mutual support, have generated a new context, I think, within which we can discuss the two countries a new imaginary, uh, that of an extended civil sphere uh, that can transcend state boundaries and policies and cut across the usual hegemonic discussions about North versus South or West versus East is, I believe, on the rise. I see this conference precisely in this context and as an effort to understand the processes through which this new imaginary is, taking, uh, is coming into place. Our gesture of solidarity, to which Hakan uh, referred earlier, at Zuccotti Park, and we have a, a nice slide here, I think. Yes. Uh, that was early in June, I forget the exact date. Uh, organized by the Occupy Gezi New York Action Group, and uh, what uh, we call AKNY, which stands for Left Movement New York, is a Greek solidarity uh, movement generated reactions which reminded us, however, of the deep fragmentations that mark the history of the two nation states. For instance, reporters of the Turkish newspaper Posta 212, which is, uh, I believe, published in Turkish, but is uh, published only here in the United States, upon some of their readers' complaints or requests at least, asked us to respond to charges that our presence at the park that day had no objective other than to belittle the Turkish government, while they also question what our organization's position is on the Kurdish and the Armenian causes. Suffice to say that we have never thought about that before. Uh, on the Greek front, the reactions were almost violent. Our pictures, among which the one that you see here, framed with the Greek and the Turkish flags, some of them carrying the image of Kemal Ataturk, Featured prominently in websites and blogs promoting the agenda of the, if you haven't heard about them yet, uh, neo Nazi group, which is going by the name Golden Dawn, which has recently emerged as an important play player, but also a destabilizing uh, power in the Greek political scene. In the midst of an outpour of obscenities, we were targeted, of course, as traitors, 
and as outright supporters of the man responsible for the slaughter of thousands of Christians and Greeks more specifically. Now, the ways in which nationalism, and especially what we could identify as radical nationalism, can raise barriers against this new expanding social imaginary, I think they're rather obvious. Now, what I think, however, is less clear, and uh, what I would like to talk to you about here today, is the relation between nationalism and neoliberalism. And uh, Jeff, no. Uh, nationalism in its symbolic collective representational capacities and the advances of the neoliberal institutionalization along with state repression and authoritarianism, contrary to the popular belief, are closely connected. The recent rise of fascism in Greece as an expression of radical nationalism or the experimentation of the Turkish government uh, with what has come to be known as uh, neo-Ottomanism, I think constitute very telling examples. I will try to explain actually how these narratives of national decline or national grandeur, widely in circulation at the moment in the region under discussion, feed of each other, and in the process are further employed to instrumentalize state over-centralization, the suppression of of uh, autonomous institutions and the undermining of civil protests across the Aegean Sea. I think that material causes unmediated by cultural representations can only have a moderate effect. And I would like again to provide some examples. Uh, some of the emblematic projects of the Erdogan government, and uh, by now you have heard plenty of uh, about it. Uh, Gezi Park and all those shopping malls that uh, actually in a couple of hours I'll be here. I learned so much about this. Um, and uh, I think I will skip the names because yes, <laughs> it, will, it will not go very well. <laughs> so, so all these all this, all this projects, they have a very, very strong symbolic dimension. Uh, they do not merely constitute examples of the inroads that local and international capital are making in the old historic districts of the city. These districts re represent the history of every republican and cosmopolitan Istanbul, as we heard a few minutes ago, which until the events of September 1955, also known as the Istanbul pogrom, was populated by various ethnic minorities and had distinct European outlook. Now, the destruction or the alteration change of this urban space and the nostalgia or glorification of the Ottoman past, as the plan of the reconstruction of the military barracks suggests, raise questions about whether these constitute conscious efforts to fabricate a new collective identity based on an Islamist and a neo-Ottoman uh, Ottomanist ideology. Uh, it was probably mentioned, of course, earlier that, that there was a plan in place also for the uh, building of a, of a mosque in the area. And if that is the case, to what effect? Is it possible that the attention uh, to the Sunni community, which is the broadest uh, base, after all, of support for the Erdogan government, constitutes a return to the national view uh, movement as a critique to Turkey's political and military dependency of the West? and their approachment with Muslim states on its way to economic development and hegemony in the, uh, in the region. It seems that the regime promotes a new national identity, that's my understanding, consolidated with a tighter embrace of Islam, and in the process of its constitution, enemies are identified, surveillance and anti-terror laws are put into place, citizens' rights are suspended in the name always of the nation's need for state stronger protection. The government's accusations against internal traitors, implying here the main opposition of the CHP, and external collaborators targeting the Jewish diaspora and the Western press as responsible for the protest and for undermining the government's successful roads toward economic development and modernization, I think offer us a quick glimpse into the process of this binary opposition building and the power of the symbolic collective cultural representation. While acknowledging now, of course, that the political situation in Turkey, the agents involved, and the questions of class, culture, and locality are way too complex to be analyzed in greater depth here, or by me, uh, there are certainly many people in this room that know way much more about this. 
Uh, I would like to turn my attention to the other side of the Aegean and briefly comment on the relationship between nationalism and neoliberalism in Greece before I try to connect the two stories. Unlike the rhetoric of national grandeur based on this neo-Ottoman identity which the Turkish government cultivates, in Greece it is a rhetoric of national decline that is pervasive. The Greek government trying to lead the state that after five consecutive years of acute recession is in shambles goes to great lengths to retain its control over society by engaging in a negative discourse through which it constitutes and targets the primordial enemies of the Greek nation, namely immigrants, anarchists, and the left. The anti-immigrant rhetoric is particularly toxic, with the Prime Minister, for example, Antonis Samaras, having recently proposed at some point that we should, I call him, reoccupy our cities while Nikos Dendias, the Minister of Public Order and Citizen Protection, has said, quote again, it is as if we are standing on the walls of Constantinople with the Ottomans, uh, Ottoman armies about to invade. You see where I'm going with that. <laughs> <laughs> the religion of the immigrants primarily targeted people from Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Southeast Asia in general make, of course, Mr. Dendias' metaphor particularly telling as to who qualifies as a member of the national community and who is not. The government, in the role of the nation's protector, has engaged in practices that have attracted the attention, of course, of international human rights organizations. In the run-up to the country's national elections in uh, 2012, just to give you a taste of what is happening, a group of, uh, a group of women, HIV-positive women, were arrested as prostitutes for potentially exposing the public's health in danger. They were detained, forcibly tested, uh, and their pictures and personal data were widely publicized, among other websites on the police website. I found out the first time they had one. Uh, the same year, 15 anti-fascist protesters were arrested, tortured, and subjected to what their lawyers described as uh, Abu Ghraib-style humiliation. And while the government puts little effort into concealing the images, after all this is part of the, uh, the work here, or the systematic civil and human rights violations, when the, Guardian, when the Guardian reported on the case, the Minister of Public Order threatened, of course, to sue the paper. Now, in the midst of virulent anti-immigrant rhetoric, coupled with uh, rampant unemployment, by now it's about 60% for people of age between 35, uh, I mean 25 and 35, and the overall social effects of austerity, the rise of fascism came as no surprise. Golden Dawn, a neo-Nazi group that polled between, or used to fall between 0.1 and 0.29 in the elections of 96 and 2009 respectively, in 2012, it rose up to receive almost 7% of the popular vote and enter the parliament with 18 MPs. Ever since, with the police and the judiciary's protection, Golden Dawn has systematically attacked and killed immigrants, almost with complete impunity, while they have been increasingly targeting anarchists and leftists alike. And while the most recent murder of a Greek musician and anti-fascist led to the arrest of the Golden Dawn leadership, it is almost certain that this will only provide another precedent for the targeting and persecution of strikers, demonstrators, and leftists already labeled as extremists and enemies of the state. In that sense, actually, Golden Dawn has been proven particularly useful to the government in building this uh, narrative where it can identify and separate the, uh, the national subject from the, uh, the dangerous uh, citizens or the dangerous in general. The relation now between neoliberalism, nationalism, and the high security nation state that we see emerging around as an administrative paradigm, probably the only model capable to handle and, uh, the expanding economic crisis, is rapidly expanding. We see it in practice all over the world. We see it in China, to Russia, from China to Russia, to Egypt, to Greece, to the United States, to Turkey. Now, despite the ambivalence of free market economics towards nationalism and the state, they have both been proven two of the most valuable handmaids for the neoliberal agenda of privatizations and deregulation. On the one side, states offer the necessary but untold need of capital for protection, while driving a hard competition for higher productivity, lower prices, and lower wages. 
On the other side, nationalism grounds this competition on a higher moral ground while binding individuals together with a sense of common and shared identity. Now, historically, Greek people and the people of Turkey have suffered dearly the effects of nationalism. We could keep, be here for a while if we start discussing uh, Cyprus or the forced exchange of population going back in the 20s based on religion. So, uh, Greece still today, in the name of maritime zone disputes, spends a disproportionate 5% of, uh, of its budget on defense, the highest actually ratio in, Dur in Europe. Competing claims to exclusive economic zones in the Aegean and Mediterranean uh, risk igniting new conflicts, while the antagonism over the tourism industry increasingly threatens both countries' cultural and natural heritage with permanent destruction. Now, if the national imaginary has failed us, the recent developments in Greece, Turkey, and beyond, of course, open up new spaces for us to reimagine our societies. The widely circulated images of millions of people simultaneously rising up and reclaiming their rights offer new possibilities for the formulation of new identities and socially just alternatives. The means now we choose to render these identities meaningful are, I think, very important. Education, I think, is paramount. Education, after all, has played such an important role in our national education, how we are trained. Art, literature, philosophy, about which I'm sure you heard more yesterday, have an important role to play. We should, after all, keep in mind that nationalism and nation building, more probably than capitalism, were first and foremost the product of the products of radical intellectual and cultural movements. Hi, I'm Michael Hart, and uh, I want to thank the organizers too, Hakan and the other organizers, um, for this great event. I'm, I'm, like this Bina, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly an outsider. I've followed with great intent, attention and enthusiasm the Gazi events, the post-Gazi events, um, but I'm not in the position, like many of you here, to really comment on the. Um, the day-to-days and particulars of the struggle. Oh, I should also say that, unfortunately, I'm at Boazici in residence only for the month of May, not the whole year. If only it were the whole year, that would be lovely. But anyway, that's, sorry. I just, uh, doesn't matter. Um, so what I want to think through, I mean, I'd have a title something like uh, From Takrir to Taxi. I want to try to think through what are the advantages and disadvantages of thinking as a cycle of struggles, the events, the encampments and occupations from 2011, or maybe even to December 2010, until the until this past summer. Um, think of what it means to put them together. In fact, the question might be something like, what does it mean to see Taksim or the Gezi struggles as an extension of the cycle of struggles of 2011? What could Gezi teach us about uh, the entire cycle, and vice versa? What can looking at that cycle teach us about the about the Gezi? About the Gezi. Um, so what I'm thinking of as a cycle here is really uh, starting more or less in, in December 2010 in, in, in Tunisia, quickly passing to Egypt. I feel like I'll say this fast because I think it's probably a, a sort of a commonplace by now. Um, after January uh, 2011 occupation in, in Tahrir and the overthrow of the government leaping in some ways across the Mediterranean starting on May 15th in the, um, the encampments in, in uh, Spain and the Spanish cities. In some ways, Syntagma Square should be part of this, too. Uh, even I would put it as part of this, the tents in Tel Aviv, as long as you don't call it an occupation. I think it fits in this. Or um, And then, finally, when we get to September 2011, uh, Zuccotti Park, I mean, one of the advantages, I think, of seeing this as a, as, a, as, a, as a cycle of struggles is that one doesn't see Zuccotti Park as the uh, initiation but rather is having a whole year at its backs before, um, before the before the beginning, and that of course proliferation of occup occupies in the U.S. outside the U.S. And so, in some ways, I would like to see, and this is partly what I'm trying to think through here, the ways in which Gezi Park and the um, and the protest movements in Brazil of 2013 are or 2013 are an extension of this. Now, when I mean a cycle of struggles, 
I should clarify for a minute, I don't at all mean that these are all the same thing. It's not at all a repetition of the same kind of protest, and it's certainly not a repetition of the same political and economic regime against which they're they're taking place. Uh, it should be clear, or I see it as clear, that that the um, first of all, in Tunisia and Egypt, were very different. Were very different political regimes, but then extremely different then to uh, to Spain, the U.S., Brazil, Turkey. These are not at all the same. Um, but I do think it's useful, even historic, even putting it in historical terms, think about a cycle of struggles, I, like what I mean by cycle of struggles. Think about it like the late 18th, early 19th century spread of slave revolts around the Caribbean. You know, so after the Haitian Revolution, it, it, it's of course very different slave regimes in Bahia and in Virginia and in the different Caribbean islands, but nonetheless, through sailors, through escaped slaves, there was the, a kind of proliferation of slave revolts. And which, so what, what does it involve a cycle? A cycle involves shared practices and aspirations, and in some ways a cycle of inspiration. So that's what, in some of the previous panels have already talked about this, the way that um, each of these movements are inspired by the previous, and in some ways through an operation of translation, uh, if you can think of translation in a strong way, of translating terms from one to the other. You know, like translating uh, the, the struggle against the uh, tyrant to the struggle against the tyranny of finance. And that involves a kind of translation, but it's nonetheless a, an inspiration. Okay. Um, so let me just say a few things about what I see as the um, characteristics of this cycle, uh, thinking of it as a cycle, and then, I could, and then I could come back to what I mean, see as the advantages and disadvantages of it. Um, let's see, I have four characteristics I, I wanted to mention briefly. The first maybe I should have the least to say about, and, and I'm partly thinking in contrast to the to the cycle of globalization protest movements more or less from 1999 to 2001, which were fundamentally nomadic, you know, that they moved from, from summit to summit, this cycle of struggles from 2011 to 2013 are fundamentally sedentary. I mean, sedentary in a good way. They're rooted in the territory. You know, like they refuse to move. You know, whereas, of course, we moved from wherever, Seattle to Quebec to Gothenburg, Prague, etc., back in 10 years ago, these are struggles that won't move. But it's not only that they won't move, it's not just that they're sedentary, they're rooted in the territory in, in the sense that their issues are, lo are, 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 are linked to or grounded in often, or most often, urban issues. So that, for instance, these uh, uh, comisiones or like working groups in, in Puerto del Sol in Madrid, you know, there are working groups on each different lakes about sexual violence in one neighborhood, about um, uh, mutuals like uh, mortgages that people can't pay, you know, in another. So very local issues. That's what I mean by rooted in terms. Anyway, that's the first aspect that I think links all of them. The, the, the encampment as a practice of rooting in, in local issues. The second is what I would call the multitude form, but you could call it what you want. I, um, what I mean. But I don't think you should call it leaderlessness. That's what I. But you know, that's the first manifestation of it. You know, so for instance, you know, during the 18. This is just an anecdote, but it was significant for me. You know, like during the 18 days of Tahrir, of Tahrir Square occupation in January of 2011, every day of those 18 days, reading the New York Times, they had a new article about who's really the leader. Like one day it was uh, Al Baradai, the, the the Nobel Prize winner. Then next day was the Google executive. I can't remember his name. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. And then the next day was three other people, either in the square or behind the square. Like they couldn't. They were just. The, each reporter was trying to get the scoop on who the real leader is. And what they couldn't figure out, for better or for worse, in Tahrir there wasn't a leader in that sense. There were unequal, but nonetheless cooperating groups that occupied the square and found ways to act politically together. That's what I'm trying to say is multitude form. And the one that I think is char the characteristic of the different uh, instantiations, elements of this cycle of struggles. Uh, which, yeah, so it's not disorganized. It's in fact puts an extra weight on organization, the, trying to discover a form of organization that can function if only without hierarchy, but at least without a centralized leadership and point of dictation. That's what I'm. That's what I'm thinking of as as, as multitude form. But and so the third one is about the central role of democracy as a guiding political concept. Um, 
And I think it's significant and, and, and very effective that this cycle began in North Africa for this. Um, you know, and I mean, uh, democracy, you know, like for instance, when I think back, and this should, shouldn't be the only other thing I compare it to, but it's always present in my mind, thinking back 10 years to the global, uh, ultra-globalization movement, global protest movement, Seattle, Geneva, etc. There, really, the guiding concept was justice, it seemed to me. You know, like even calling it a global justice movement. Whereas, in this contemporary cycle, democracy fills somewhat the same role. Yeah, so that even, you know, so that in, in the um, encampments in, in Spain, by May of 2011, a founding slogan of the encampments is democracia real ya, like real democracy now. Which you might think, so it's even, I find it interesting, this is my understanding of it from, you know, from friends involved in the early part of the occupation, is that, like the, well, of course, in Spain, like in all these other places, too, they weren't mostly veteran activists who were doing the occupation. So it was mostly people new to politics. But the veteran activists in Spain were kind of embarrassed by this. Like, real democracy? Now, like any good leftist, by which I mean, like, cynical, can't talk about democracy. Like, that's, in the last 20 years, 30 years, that's, like, become essentially a, a, a political concept that's been completely evacuated. Democracy mean what, what democracy means at best um, the periodic elections among a limited few with corporate sponsorship. And what it usually means outside the U.S., of course, is that you better start running because the bombs will start falling soon if they're talking about democracy. So that democracy is be, seems to me has been completely evacuated. And yet a certain kind of naivete of being able to insist on like a real democracy now, even without knowing what that real democracy means, but to distinguish it from the democracy that's imposed as the, as the norm, that seems to me really effective and characteristic, I would say, of the different... I, for me, it reaches a conceptual high point in, in, in Spain in May, but I think it's characteristic of all the different ones. In fact, I would love to think and hear from you about what, what, what the concept of democracy in Gezi means and what a real democracy means in Gezi. Okay, that's the third one. Um, the fourth one... Yeah, okay, I should say something about that in a minute, too. The fourth one is um, about what I would call the right to the common, and, and, and maybe it's easiest to explain by, by the previous presentations by the architects and urban planners. But I mean, uh, in fact, Gezi is the one that, in fact, looking back at the whole, at the others' previous protests, I think become most clear in this regard from, from the perspective of, of Gezi, because... Uh, now I'm just saying things that you all know much better than I. But of course, the the, the opening moment of Casey of the protest of the of the of the shopping mall in the form of a Ottoman barracks. Like who could dream up shit like that? It's like <laughs> from the outside, at least a non-Turk. I don't know what they. Uh, anyway, so in, in some sense, it's a typical it's a typical anti-neoliberal struggle. You know, like the, about about a a park being transformed in private property, but. You can't just call it an anti-neoliberal struggle as if it's against private property and you want to rely on the public, meaning the state, against it. And this is a case where the distinction between the state, here I would call public property, and private property are really indistinguishable. And so you can't just say, or it seems to me that the perspective is to, even the perspective of the beginning of the protest is that it's not just a choice between private property, neoliberalism, privatization tech, uh, strategies, and public property, meaning state regulation and control, like that that's a false alternative. That in fact, uh, another position, one different, see what I would call by the common, uh, is possible. And it seems to me that part of the occupations in Gezi and others is trying to enact this. So what do I mean by the common? I would put the public property and private property together saying that both of them operate by a logic of, of, of uh, limited access and a monopoly over decision making. You know, either whether that's in case of private property in an obvious way, or in case of public property in the sense that the state or governmental structures have a monopoly over decision making and a and a and a, and a limitation of access. So what the common would have to be would be would be a space or also a practice characterized by open equal access and collective democratic decision making. That seems to me, so I guess I should just take a little parenthesis because I was thinking in the previous panel, there's a lot of terminological confusion about this and I, I don't know what to do about it, but a lot of when people talk about public space, I think sometimes they mean what I mean by the common. Sometimes they mean, though, 
what I would call public, meaning controlled by. And so, yeah, here again, like think about uh, Reclaim the Streets, the, the English group that was well known, or British group, like 10 years ago. If you think the streets are public, like meaning that you have open access to them, like the streets are ours, they or critical mass or any number of other groups, they'll tell you that the police will tell you that it's actually really not your streets. Like, so that um, if you're ever confused about something that's public being actually having open access and collective decision making, you'll quickly find that it turns out that it has limited access and a regulated decision making by the state. So, making something actually common. And this is what I think is the magic of the encampments. I think the feeling of the magicalness of the encampments, Zuccotti, Puerto del Sol, Tahrir, Gezi, that magic is the, the, the making an urban space common. Yeah, so I would say it's true that someone said earlier too that there, all these movements are characterized by the a notion of the right to, to the city. And I guess I would even say I would say they're characterized by a process, an attempt, to make the urban space common. So neither then under the rule of private property, nor uh, regulated and under the decision making of the state. Something like that. Okay, that's, it, I guess even ultimately, even ultimately I would say, or this is the point that interests me most from a political perspective, is that in each of these encampments, there's an attempt to make the political process common. Like, so what do I mean again by that? You make the political process common by being at equal and open access to all and a collective democratic decision making over the word. So when you think about what is a general assembly, what are all the different forums that were in Gezi and elsewhere in, in, in Turkey, I, I interpret them as trying to make the political process common, like trying to open up the word, you know, open up the, to give equal access just to, to participation and then not a completely, obviously, disorganized or, or imagining we could have a spontaneous one, but create structures, I would even say institutions, but let's just say repeated practices of democratic decision making. You know, I, I say, uh, let's see, I should, I should also take a break with that. You know, like any one, of, any one of you who have ever participated in any of the general assemblies know how fucked up they are. Like that, uh, and, and how frustrating it is and how unsuccessful it is. But nonetheless, I'm sure that each of you would also recognize the, the kind of the excitement of that aspiration and the importance of that aspiration to make it, to make the political process common to create a real democracy I think I see this as synonyms of something as the kind of aspiration that's running through all the that's running through all the things should I stop sooner a little bit okay okay thanks so um, right so those were my four characteristics to try to give you I was just trying to give you a rationale for why we might consider this a cycle, in some ways why it might be useful. Obvious disadvantage of considering these a cycle of struggles is that um, it eclipses many of the specific characteristics. You know, the questions of religious difference, the, the question of the, the Kurdish issue, of course, in, in Turkey would be eclipsed by seeing it together with the others. So you lose, you certainly do, and I'm perfectly conscious of this, lose the specificity, but I think what you gain, I mean, uh, recognize that one loses, one gains, I say we, you overcome the risk of a national focus, uh, a, a local and national focus, which I think encampments and occupations uh, pose that risk. And then, and then also it, it highlights, this is the last thing I want to say, but it'll take me a couple minutes. It highlights the problem of continuity. Now let me pose a little bit, try to give you an idea of this. I've seen continuity in two ways, or rather, I put it this way. I think the problem of continuity is the major problem or challenge faced from within the movements of the last of the last ten or fifteen years. Like um, we've been, if you if you'll excuse my plural we of this sort of thing, we've been really great at organizing a square uh, or a small space for two or three months. We've really sucked at creating something long-lasting and uh, a wide social transformation. So that what I'm thinking of this is a question of, of continuity. Now, like in one way, you might view it this way: like here's the, here's the, here's the, here's the consolation view. The consolation view is the image that repeatedly comes to me from Marx, the famous image from the 18th Brumaire, uh, when Marx poses the the work of the mole as being a kind of hidden continuity. So what's Marx, what's Marx doing that part? Marx, first of all, you know, 
when Marx is writing in 1851, things suck. Like uh, a new revolution has just has just been has just been completely obliterated. And so what he's trying to read is revolutionary struggles in France over the last uh, a series of defeats, obviously. But he, but what he he gives this image of the mole to recognize a continuity despite defeat. So that's where it goes. So the, well, here's the metaphor, you know, in case it's not present for you. So this mole, it appears at moments of revolutionary activity. So in 1789 in France, uh, the mole appears. But then it goes underground, defeated, goes underground, and then it reappears in 1815, uh, 1830, 1848, later at 1870. Um, it reappears periodically, and Marx says even better than that. It's not just that it's still alive when it's hidden. When you don't see it, he says it's working with the times, like it's actually progressing, so that next time it comes up, some years later, it's actually moved along. And so one could pose that. I, it's for my in my mind that motive that metaphor is working in two ways. Thinking about this current cycle of struggles, on the one you could use it sort of geographically, and you could say, or this is what I say to myself. But in a minute, I'll crit criticize myself for thinking this way, um, which is that is that something like that mole appeared in Tunis, you know, and then it. And then it disappeared and appears in, 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 in Egypt, and then it disappears and appears in Spain, it appears across the Atlantic, etc. And so what we've had in the last three years is a kind of repeated appearances of this revolutionary activity. You could also think about it, or I also think about it in each place over time, and this is much more like the way Marx was doing it, which where you'd say, look, okay, um, there's been a defeat in... Um, in Tunisia, there's been a defeat in, in Egypt of revolution activity, but we'll be back. And there will be back, it might take 20 years, but then, you know, like in France, it was a long time between 1815 and 1830 and 1848. Um, and so that, uh, or even one could say that with Gezi too, that uh, despite its seeming disappearance, it will rise up again. I think that, I do think that's useful because there is a kind of communication of struggles, a communication, like I said, of practices and aspirations, a kind of development. I'm even tempted sometimes, but I, I think this is somewhat wrong, too, to say something like the, you know, the aspirations of Tahrir in some ways were, 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 were realized in Zuccotti, and what sometimes the aspirations of Zuccotti were really realized in Daisy Park, etc. Now, there's two reasons, at least, why that's not a good idea, or it's not a good metaphor. One is that you know, people, unfortunately, we have to live in the here and now. It's not very comforting to people to say, okay, things might suck now, but 30 years later, even if you're dead, that will reappear, or or even elsewhere. You know, that, so there's something about the continuity that doesn't. And, we're, and I think the other thing about the cons consolation of that metaphor, or that notion of, of a kind of subterranean continuity, is that it doesn't have us face what seems to me is the primary challenge, which is one about constructing a continuity like that because I because it's not only me I feel like the my sense also this doesn't seem to feel like to me like something from the outside but of, of, of the activists themselves in all of these locations are dissatisfied with the ephemeral and temporary nature of the of the of the, of the successes now here's where I think <coughs> I just want to say one last metaphor and then I could just maybe just send it there but I feel like too often, right at this point, I'm or I feel dissatisfied with. Too many people feel that we're faced with an alternative, like either. Either we could have something beautiful, and temporary, which is temporary and ineffective, or we could choose something ugly that might be effective and long-lasting. Like that, either we could have something beautiful, meaning truly democratic, creative, um, inspiring, fulfilling of so many desires. But that that would be ineffective and and and, and, and short-lasting, or we could we could accept hierarchical traditional political forms and kind of hold your nose, hoping that it'll be effective and um, and um, and long-lasting. I don't think that's and and usually for this for the second for this choice that he says off of the example, like that the people will say, okay, you know, the problem with Gezi, you needed said you said you're like you need foreign partner. You need or in the U.S., it's more like uh, Wall Street will, you know, Occupy Wall Street will never do anything until it has its Martin Luther King. Like until you get the the charismatic leader with the with the traditional hierarchical structure, you'll never be effective. I refuse to accept that alternative. 
I don't think that, and I don't think it's true. Uh, I don't think it's true in a variety of ways. One is that um, I don't think it's true on the one hand that accepting, okay, uh, one minute, that's good. I, I'll stop with one minute. I don't think it's true on the one hand that um, centralized hierarchical structures, say the traditional party form for, 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 for shorthand, is what really will be effective about the existing powers and will be long lasting. That's the one thing. But on the other hand, I also refuse to accept that without centralization and hierarchical structures, we cannot construct effective and long lasting organizations. I refuse to accept this uh, uh, to, I refuse to accept, there you go, that, um, that really democratic, to use the naive Spanish formulation, that really democratic structures can't be effective and, and long lasting. So I know I'm not saying, I, I know I'm not, it's one of these moments where I'm, I'm not saying, oh, look at what's happened in the past, we could do like them. No, this would have to be something truly new, it seems to me. But at least for, in my view, what's, what I find truly inspiring and looking towards the future of these different events is even in their failure, their search for uh, a, really demo a really democratic formation and that, and that desire for a lasting and effective alternative is real. And in some ways, political desires are the first building blocks for their, for their subsequent realization. Okay, that's what I have. Thanks. Okay, so first I'd like to say that I'm delighted to be taking part in this conference. It's a real honor to be asked to do this, despite the fact that I know uh, not very much in, uh, about Turkey, or nothing, nothing particularly special about Turkey. Um, um, uh, but I really admire uh, what I've been hearing uh, today and what I've been reading about um, uh, before that. So it's an honor to be here, and uh, I thank the organizers for putting together such an incredibly interesting conference. Um, amazingly uh, good conference because still so many people are still here uh, uh, to listen to me, the last formal speaker. Usually it's a, a way to get out of, you know, get, get yourself to be the last so that, you know, that not many people are going to be paying attention to you. Uh, the, the, the other thing is that I'm, I, I'm really, really, really happy that the conference is here uh, at my intellectual home the New School for Social Research, because the thrust of the conference uh, helps us continue to define this institution as a place of free, critical inquiry engaged in the world uh, um, uh, independently uh, uh, and uh, uh, with ideals and realism. So, so uh, uh, there's a sense in which the conference gives us a gift and I know that uh, I speak not only for myself, but for many of my colleagues in that regard, some of whom are in the room, uh, students and faculty. So I, I think it's, it, it's very, very exciting that this conference is here, and I'm honored to, to, uh, uh, being, to take part in the discussion. I also want to say that I had anticipated uh, uh, having a more polemical relationship uh, with Michael Hart and Despina Lovke than I think I'm going to have because I, I, I you know, the, uh, I, you know, my, my uh, uh, the, the, the book of mine that expresses my uh, sensibility the most uh, accurately is the politics of small things, and th that has to do with my commitments and also with my limitations. That there are some big things that people see that I actually have trouble seeing. So it's only until very recently that I uh, let pass through my lips the term neoliberalism uh, because it, it, it has confused me. And uh, empire for me is actually a difficult word. Now, now I, I want to make clear, I'm not against using these words. It's not that I know that these things don't exist, but I have trouble perceiving them. And not only do I have trouble perceiving them, I have some worries that they mislead. And uh, I think that my talk, uh, you know, my comments now, I'm not going to give a formal talk. My comments now are actually um, you know, animated by that, uh, that, that concern. And I, I, I actually 
the four characteristics I uh, I agree with completely. You know, I, I think you know I don't know if I would call it a cycle, but I, I actually see this pattern uh, emerging globally, and I, I, I think it says something about uh, our place and our time where we are right now, uh, uh, and that indeed maybe it's a little bit of an end, uh, uh, an indication that we are human beings together at this moment in history, and that we face uh, some similar uh, patterns, and also that we actually are developing uh, political capacities. And, and I, I'm particularly interested, what I would like to talk to you about is actually the developing capacity. And uh, in that regard, uh, I, uh, on the train here this morning, I, uh, or maybe it was last night, I, I wrote a very late uh, email to Hakan. I, I, I had a title. And my title is uh, Thinking About Occupy Solidarity through the lens of Salidar Nosht. So Salidar Nosht is the uh, um, uh, political union movement in Poland in the 1980s. Uh, and it strikes me that the lessons of uh, that struggle, which uh, have not actually been learned very much by the Polish government or the different po Polish political parties, but the, the le or, or you know, the way I read that, those lessons and the way they read those lessons uh, are, are, are quite different. So I'm uh, nice that I got an award, but uh, I, I feel somewhat embarrassed by it as well. Uh, um, but the, the, the um, uh, but I think that there's something about the struggle back then that actually uh, uh, speaks to uh, the struggles now. And I indeed, I remember, uh, you know, those of you who don't know about solidarity, there was a guy by the name of Lech Wałęsa. Uh, and he won the Nobel Prize as the leader of the Solidarity And being someone who was, I was sort of involved in the Solidarity And I remember being really perplexed when it came about that uh, the international press started defining the movement as being that of Lech Valenza. And of course, I'm not reporting to you, some, to you something that's not known in the United States. Many people in the civil rights movement were deeply concerned, and the historians of this civil rights movement continue to be concerned by the idea that the civil rights movement was movement of Martin Luther King Jr. Because, of course, many, many other people were involved, uh, and uh, sometimes the people who have personified the movement, uh, have come to personify the movement, um, um, were wrong at critical junctures in the development. So, so you know, just a little note on that. So um, I want to say you know, I have a major thesis, and that is I think the form of the new new social movement, Michael's cycle, um, uh, the moments uh, movements of, from 2011 to 2013, the form expresses their most significant content. That the movements and the occupations of Tahir Square. Uh, two Zuccotti and Gezi parks are defined by the way they have been constituting new kinds of public life. The way that it, they have been constituting new kinds of po public life. Making possible such things as that which we have been discussing these past two days. So I would say, you know, to get an idea of the significance of the, mo of the Gezi moments, um, and to not have a pessimist view, just think about what we've been discussing and try to imagine if this kind of the discussion about the things that we have been talking uh, would have been possible without the movement. So that's an immediate fruit of the movement, and it means that the movement is its message. It means that politics is an end in itself, that it bears immediate fruit, the activity itself, and that there's absolutely no reason to be waiting, waiting around for moles. That, that indeed, the accomplishment has already happened. Now, whether the end of the, the you know, I, there are no ends of the story, but, but if you want to imagine to what ha about what happens next and whether things can be better, and if you want to confront the very real disappointments uh, that, that we have faced, you, you can 
do some critical analysis of what we've done and what we might have done differently, uh, how to connect the utopian visions of uh, political action with more realistic or practical compromised visions of political action. I think that's actually what you, you presented in either or. So one thing I disagreed with you on, you know, the idea that we have to do something beautiful or do something practical and dirty, uh, that's dirty that might be successful. Well, you know, I think we're capable of doing more than one thing. So, so, so and, and that a very, very big political challenge for um, uh, the people of Gezi Park is actually to figure out how to do those two things, how to keep the utopian inspiration alive on the one hand, and then actually how to engage uh, in uh, practical action that will make, uh, 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 realize to some degree uh, the dreams and actually uh, remember and concretize the already existing accomplishments. So I was sitting around here and I heard uh, discussions. Uh, now I'm going to say names and you're going to be, uh, I hope you're not offended by what I do to your names. <laughs> so uh, Ezra Khan spoke about participatory design and the whole, and we had a very, very interesting discussion a few moments ago uh, about that and the relationship between architecture and the participation, what the role of the architect could be. And I want to point out that that, that discussion, which is a long-standing discussion, has life uh, 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 that's different because of the activities in Gezi Park and the, uh, uh, um, really shown to us by one of the slides uh, that she presented. Neil, um, Neil Kazakov, he's gone. Okay, so it's uh, uh, confused me. He said, he said somehow that it's all really about uh, uh, real estate and, uh, and neoliberalism and, and that uh, politics um, is uh, mass theater. But then he actually went on and talked about the practical actions that people were doing when they're engaged in Gezi Park as having very big consequences. We have to note that that's uh, um, uh, politics. Uh, uh, we, we, I'm not even going to give names. There was a discussion about the enactment of the equality and democracy as being an every uh, by Ortus Tombas, but, you know, as an experience in the park. So the the the, the point is that this, this these ideals existed. They weren't just ideals. They were practical actions. They were experiences. We need to remember that. No, I'm gonna not continue. But I, I, I because I, I was just overwhelmed. With the solidarity culture. All social segments met each other. Uh, uh, the east and the west of Turkey could speak through the sensibility of feminists uh, 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 and of LGBT people. You know, these were things that were done. And and uh, and life is not the same because they happen because these stories were told. So so I think it's very very important to pay attention to the form and to pay attention to what appeared and to pay attention to uh, uh, what and to imagine what can be can happen next. Now I know that uh, so for some people this is uh, the, the enemy the problem can be reduced to uh, some economic issue, uh, I call it neoliberalism. But in fact, I, I think that as we go from country to country to country and think about the different experiences, we need to realize that these are about the problems of people engage, people's engagement, whether the problem is previously existing socialism, my uh, world of uh, uh, kind of uh, risky Activity, and it's also involved in the, the new left here, but I don't take it at all that seriously. And, and uh, uh, I wasn't um, uh, brought this up. Uh, 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 but but th th that, um, um, and, and that's, it's a problem in very, very de different economic situations, very different authoritarian challenges uh, around the world. That's part of the cycle. So, so, so I, I'm really, I really want to emphasize the importance of what might be called uh, the, the repertoire 
of, uh, of, of political action that one can, one can notice these days. So uh, I don't. I have trouble finding common causes. Uh, I uh, but I actually see similarities in uh, a kind of developing learning process that social movements uh, uh, um, uh, discover, invent, reveal, and indeed, thanks to the media world we live in, share very quickly. I mean, they shared it previously, uh, but it, 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 it's almost instantaneous, so that Michael can ima imagine that you know one movement is acting in response to another movement, who, and then the original movement thinks about the response, and it's not just a figment of his imagination, that that's actually occurring. So, so um, um, I, I, I think that the, the key to understand, to appreciating this, is to understand that there are different kinds of power. And uh, I wrote about the politics of small towns. This is, uh, you know, analyzing this power as it existed, um, book as it existed in in, uh, uh, in the solidarity movement, in pre-solidarity movement, and, the, and then also in the uh, 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 Dean campaign in the United States. Uh, 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 more interesting, Václav Havel uh, described very beautifully uh, in, I think, one of the great essays of the uh, 20th century. I'm already going to, uh, okay, the, the, the power of the powerless. Uh, and indeed, I think this is what Hannah Arendt uh, means by this power. This is what she actually thinks politics is. Now, I want to suggest Oh, don't do that to me. <laughs> this is me. I'm censored. Okay. Social movements of the 19th century were very clear. The ones that, uh, uh, among others, Marx was focused on, archetypically the labor movement, was uh, focused on interests, uh, uh, its relationships to, to, uh, to political economy, uh, identity, was more or less taken for granted. Uh, 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 though later Marxists had to deal with the problem. And it was more or less taken for granted. But then when we started seeing social movements that actually were constituted by identity, the so-called new social movements uh, that uh, my dear uh, late friend Alberto Malucci analyzed so uh, uh, poignantly, uh, um, uh, he and his teacher, Alain Turin, noticed that a significant part of the social movements in, let's say, the 70s and 80s had identity as its focus, so that the subject was created in the action. So it, it, the subject, the, 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 the political actor was not uh, a response to, to some, or not an immediate response to some given structural relationship, but rather it was of the actor's making. Now, what I'm noticing in these movements, what I saw, but also what I saw earlier in Solidarity, is that a very, very significant part of social movements is actually the constitution of free publics. And, uh, and I think that the, prob the challenge is to actually try to institutionalize, try to give some stickiness to these free publics that are formed, and then also try, uh, 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 you know, that's the political task. The scholarly task is actually to observe that it's happening. And that then uh, I counsel that we be good sociologists. And we think about the relationship, which I am, I hope, uh, uh, we, we think about the relationship between these publics and other institutions that don't just melt away on their own and that it's a very important part of the project to actually relate to existing institutions, political and economic. So uh, I had citations to some of my colleagues' work. I was going to talk to you about the uh, protests that I don't understand about this uh, conference and to point out to the fact that I'm very proud of uh, uh, Jonathan and, and, and Vander Lippe and, and president of the university in the way they responded to it, and uh, that indeed what uh, I think uh, we learned by the conference, by being at the New School, by uh, uh, the, uh, the fruits of these social movements, 
is the absolute centrality of politi the politics of publics and the creative constitution of public. And I deeply regret I missed the uh, session last uh, yesterday afternoon on the arts, because I think that the arts play a very important role. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, first, I'd like he's going to respond to this conversation that we had. Then we are going to open for the questions. Um, so something that was interesting, which sort of Michael brought up was like looking at things in terms of cycles. And I think it's clear to all of us who have engaged with these movements that, you know, those four characteristics, you could ask anyone, they would pick them out like fairly consistently. Um, but when you look at, I guess, the genesis or like the specific events which triggered off, you know, these occupations everywhere, you know, in one case it was high intensity self-immolation, you know, in Desi it was a very peaceful, you know, safe the path movement. In Occupy Wall Street, it was an amazing choice of like having this big rally which ended up in a space where it wasn't meant to be. And it was because it was a, this definition of like a privately owned public space. It wasn't a safe public space. It was because it didn't have proper regulations on how long it could stay there. So I'm sort of interested to sort of wonder if the panel sort of has any thoughts on um, the, what are the characteristics in between mobilizations, you know, both leading up to, and I think, you know, the discussion on social media, how information is transferred is interesting because in different places, you know, especially here, we saw how they did it well in Egypt and Tahir that, you know, that big rallies could be mobilized um, just with the press of the button. And this is something which we saw in Turkey quite strongly that suddenly people were brilliant at social media, you know, and like created creative memes like, you know, the Rand Adam and, you know, the penguins and all of these things. It was fantastic stuff. And then also like afterwards, you know, what sort of infrastructure gets built so that we don't just look at it as sort of like a sine wave sort of structure um, whereby, you know, you suddenly have these large mobilizations, but then, you know, how do they become effective? What sort of really long-term infrastructure get, gets built? And if you look at, for instance, in Occupy here, what happened last, this time last year was, you know, Hurricane Sandy. And it was a lot of the grassroots relief effort was led because there was this infrastructure built from this very different thing, you know, very political mobilization. So I'm wondering if anyone has sort of looked at that in between mobilizations to see if there's any commonalities in what happened afterwards. Um, yes, I think we sort of like here and there we all started going that direction, but nobody really went down that path. Uh, what happens in the in between, or what brought us here also? Because all these scenes, okay, they uh, uh, populated like the, the social media point that was like really overwhelming and beautiful, of course, at the same time. But we haven't, uh, I think, studied enough what uh, preparation in uh, many, uh, many times uh, took place to get there. Uh, and we can talk about the Tahir Square, and we can talk about uh, unions, and we can talk about the works that uh, preceded that, and or other smaller kinds of protests that led up to this, this, uh, these bigger events. And I think this is a ground where uh, there is a lot of interest to, to look at. Also, what I think is quite interesting is what happens after those occupations, those squares, what happened in Sindarma, what happened in uh, all these squares, where all these people went. I mean, uh, are those people that they are still active in the social media or organizing? Or, uh, because I do think that they are there. And uh, I can draw from the example of Greece that I, I notice and I observe that quite a few things are changing. Precisely because, so for the most part, it's because out of me, uh, the the dissolution really of the, the state not being able to respond to people's needs, people start organizing. And traditionally in Greece, there is a very, very strong, problematic, but strong relationship between uh, the state and citizens. Um, uh, it's almost like a family thing. Uh, so there is a unintended emancipation from that uh, relationship and people start organizing on the base of uh, neighborhood while until now family had been really like the, the connecting uh, 
point here. And trying to respond to immediate problems that the government or even uh, the opposition, even the left, is not able to respond in order to uh, feed themselves, to feed each other, to, either to find jobs or, or exchange uh, products since, since money is short. So I think these are the processes and these are the, the things that we should really study more closely. And this is where actually something new might actually come. Just one little, this is more like oh, a, yeah, well, no, it's just one of the question more like for, for y'all or for others. I, I was thinking about this in between, which is really interesting to me. And the one example, or an example that I'm curious about is the mistranslation of the hashtag Direngezi, which is often translated as Occupy Gezi, like instead of Resist Gezi. And I, I assume the mistranslation is in order to make it visible to people elsewhere by saying there's a relationship between this and Occupy. And that seems like an interesting, um, uh, I mean, there in that case, it's, it partly takes, I'm sure there's a certain amount of, and that's the kind of thing I'd love to hear more about, taking inspiration from what had happened before in 2011 in the US and elsewhere. But then here with this mistranslation, it seems also like a, in order to render comprehensible what we're doing, we have to put in a language that's internationally understood. And that's why it's, anyway, that's, it's all part, I, I was thinking that it's part of the importance of it. Um, I mean, the, 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 the ethnographer who would do this work, you know, could talk, and, and you all and I know all different anecdotes, but I mean, the fact of, I don't know, of, of uh, an activist from 16 Beaver going to Tunisia the summer before in 2011 that then in some ways makes possible certain thinking or I think those kinds of things are a real we call it, concrete connection of, of uh, not just getting inspired by reading the paper but actually creating connection with my action. and it seems like very there is, there is this term like now in Greece, uh, there is a discussion about anarcho-tourism. Anarcho-tourism. Hakan, could I just add one thing to it? Because as a social media geek who sort of worked with the wonderful expatriate Turkish community here, um, so one of the things that you mentioned is it is interesting, this legibility or like common language that we use to signify counter, you know, power, revolutionary struggles around the world. Um, I think it was because something that's been amazing why there were big mobilizations here and that it got in the English news was because with the Turkish community, they're all around the world. I'm from Australia originally, there was a huge protest there as well. And so it's sort of interesting, sort of this idea that there are, you know, it's sort of, we're world citizens now and, you know, because we have this common architecture which is on the internet that, you know, we can sort of transfer those ideas in that way and then we're more knowledgeable in that way. But, yeah. You already have to have the third group, and second group, and third group for uh, yeah, just uh, quickly. I, I think after you know today's women speaking, Gezi is coming to end, and I think this 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 there's a tendency, of course, we need to compare, but also to look at the extreme differences, because I I really find a hard time comparing both Gezi and Tahrir with with Occupy Wall Street. Uh, Simply because even we heard today that someone called Gezi rebellion, rebellion uprising, and we we sort of missed I think a big part of the people participating in Gezi, or the ones that gave the legitimacy to the people in the park, and that is the masses. That is huge neighborhoods that it, within three hours came out with their pots and pans, and many of them are they are capitalist. They have no problem with neoliberalism. They're Kamalist. They're the, I mean, my neighborhood, almost 80% are Kamalists. I keep on saying this. We have not heard this side of it. We have not heard this side of it. And they are the ones that gave the legitimacy to the Gezi protesters. Cairo is something very similar. What's happening? With Occupy Wall Street, is they, they, they weren't able to, uh, to recruit the masses in, in any means. It was in that sense, it was a fail, somewhat a failure. So, so I would I would like to look at the, um, you know, we've been looking at what is similar, but what's different, and the huge difference is maybe you could ponder on one or two of them only. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay, so, so, so I, I am a strong advocate of uh, political activists uh, doing politics in the vernacular. And actually, to tell you the truth, uh, I think that your account of uh, Occupy is uh, maybe towards the end accurate, but not at the beginning. And that, that indeed, what impresses me about the Gezi uh, uh, event uh, or rebellion, occupation, resistance, is that it actually connected people who really were different. I didn't, you know, many things I wanted to say I didn't say. In their differences, they spoke to each other. In their differences, they developed to act in concert. That's at the core of what I actually wanted to say. And they reached out, they reached out to people who weren't there, who were like them, who had shared their identity with them, but not with everyone in, in the park. And I, I think that, that that was actually true in all of these things. And, and, and that's one thing to, to mark, something notable happened, that, that the capacity, you know, a, a, and this is in a way uh, um, uh, an instance of people acting in a, among themselves and redefining what it means to be democratic or enriching what it means to be de democratic, not as a discussion in political theory, but as a matter of practical action. So, so. Yeah, please. I actually have a quick response to Jeffrey uh, Rockpap. I interpreted your analysis as a little bit of a dissociation dissoci between, you know, the uh, identities and republics versus political economy, so on and so forth. But as a, one of the organizers, since 2007 of LGBT Pride, as well as, you know, my moment with the women's movement that this movement has always seen these things as a matrix rather than, you know, uh, seeing them separate, which to me is very important because it, it's, it differentiates identity politics versus identity in And within that framework, uh, when even starting with the 2007, I can talk from the, all the women's, uh, or like the women's, protests and uprisings as well as the LGBT uprisings because there is a little bit of like this conception of like certain groups that are in complete align coming together at this like this event easy that happened the first time. Which is in my experience it's not true. And uh, but I think part of the reason of, for instance the two thousand seven Pride if you look at the rhetoric it was always anti nationalist, anti militarist, so and anti capitalist and uh, the the prism was very much about like these identities channeling the the matrix, matrix of power that they live in through their identities and through their, their, their perspectives and coming together to be able to have a wider and a fuller analysis and to envision something that can be, you know, counted with. Thank you. I feel so intimidated by this thing. Okay, uh, I would like, I mean, or maybe all of you, or maybe just uh, hard to talk. The question of continuity is really a very, very pressing issue right now. I mean, we can be all romantic and very happy about the moment, and we feel like Hanar and in revolution kind of moment, but it seems like the continuity issue is extremely pressing issue. And I'm saying this, Jeff, because you know this is new school after all. And Ahmed Tonak was here 35 years ago doing something, and then. 20 years ago, I came here and I did some activism. I did not know about Ahmed. These young people don't know about me. We have no continuity whatsoever. And this is new school. And you are here all the time. <laughs> and, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and the issue. Let to get your question. I'll, I'll get to the question. <laughs> I've been here forever. I know. And will be. Yeah, I know. New and they, I, and they like don't know Solidarność. Uh, the, the issue is, and I mean, you would be surprised that a Tilly-esque language is going to be spoken right now, uh -huh. the repertoires have changed, but somehow none of these repertoires have been uh, sustained and continued to um, inspire and motivate for future action. I mean, 
I would be really depressed if 20 years later nobody remembers these young people <laughs> and their activism. I mean, they have internet. I know we didn't have internet, and Ahmed ha didn't have anything. <laughs> but, cool. but now I think instead of instead of petting on our you know on our back and you know congratulating this disaster that he called the general assemblies, how can it be How can these be sustained? I mean, Sheila Ben Abid may turn up saying that of. Oh, deliberative sustainability or something like that. But how is that going to be done? I mean, the Leninist in me has awoken some months ago, and you know, I want democratic centralization. Thank because you. I don't hear anything else. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, we are going to, I'm informed that we have to close this place at 6.30. Unfortunately, somebody decided. So we, I'm going to get the last question, and then we have to respond. And Sheila uh, Hanum is going to ask the uh, last question. Sorry about that. Um, I enjoyed this uh, panel enormously. For some reason, I'm not as pessimistic as uh, Kumar on this. I see a great deal of continuity. In fact, I was going to extend Michael and all the branch and say some of the concepts that you're looking for are really in Hanare. Yes. She's the she's the theorist of the non-state bound yeah. public sphere and the joy in politics. And Kumar already mentioned. Uh, on revolution moment, I have a dilemma, and it's a real, it's a real dilemma. I think that without these social movements and without your generation, you know, putting your butt on the line the way we put ours on the line, not much will get changed. But I am concerned about something that Jeffrey pointed out. That the form of the new, new social movements expresses their social content. This has something to do with the worldwide worldwide mediatic quality, the theatricality, the performativity of the public sphere, which is quite different. I mean, I'm the Habermasian peers of the public sphere, but more and more, I see that performativity is trumping mm -hmm. uh, more these deliberative moments. And what I'm really concerned about, and what I'm really very scared about, is this democratic disconnect between the institutions and you know the fact that these protest movements they're like forms you know of a wave they come and you know and uh, I'll just say one thing 1968 the protest movement I don't know how it happened it happened differently in every country but there was this notion of the long march through the institutions don't give up on the institutions don't because, uh, you know, as much as they are awful right now, I mean, look at United States politics. But I mean, I think in the case of Turkey, the accumulation is there for breaking through this logjam of AKP, JHP, militarism, you know, liberal bourgeoisie. You know, I mean, you know, I just feel like don't give up on those institutions in the universities, in parliaments, in art, in architecture, in urbanism. So this has been a very exciting. I feel like a grandma. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. What I, I suggest that we, we start <laughs> answering, uh, we give uh, a chance for each uh, panelist, starting from Michael. I'm going to get the last word. Oh, good. That's good. Yeah, I don't, I, I mean, um, I, I guess I just wanted to iterate to the, the two things that were said, which I, I don't have any, I mean, I do, uh, like, Homeru, is that your name? I, I also see new is a pressing issue. Um, and I guess my only point about it is I'm not, um, I, I don't think that continuity is only, um, can only be made through uh, traditional political structures. I, that, but that's, but you're right, I, I need to demonstrate that, or someone needs to demonstrate that, and, and actually the, these things don't get demonstrated in intellectual conversations like this. They get demonstrated in collective practice when things happen. But anyway, I agree that that's, that seems to be the pressing issue. And I guess I, I'm also I like the notion of a long march. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, but but could it be not just a long march through the in existing institution? Couldn't it be? I, I don't want to give up on institutions by which I mean something like what the anthropologists mean, like repeated social practices, but not necessarily institutions like. Um, the, the, the current uh, forms of institutions we have now. Are you so excluding I, the current ones? Mm -hmm. Because you're actually saying something, you're saying uh, not only, but you're, you're not saying whether or not you're actually right. 
dismiss it. I think I, my my feeling that is that in practice that doesn't it, it, one can't have an exclusive uh, attitude towards it. But that doesn't mean that in theoretical terms we can't think about and even and then in practical terms try to create a different kind of institution mm -hmm. and that 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 functions and so. I'm hesitant to use the German institution because I, I feel like it often gets misunderstood as being, but I think that, uh, because I think that there could be a um, an open and democratic form of repeated social practice that I would call institution. So it's in that sense I wouldn't give up on the institution. But I do want to attack some of the existing institutions. Not just, uh, well like for instance, uh, again, uh, it's the, it's the, uh, Indignados in Spain that often come to mind with the slogans of these sort of things. And like so, when they when they say you don't represent us, it's not just that like there's one bad party or one bad politician. It's the entire political structure that doesn't represent us, and in fact can't represent us. I mean, so it, I, I I would I would want that to not give up on institutions that at least have the possibility for a relatively um, thoroughgoing recreation of or new creation of institutional structure. I think we're on the same line about that, but I just wanted to add that. That's only I didn't have it. Uh, yes, I guess about the question of uh, continuity or uh, discontinuities. Uh, I I understand the frustration and the <laughs> but. Uh, uh, and your reference to new school, as far as I know, new school, and, or <laughs> it's it's not the same institution, right? Uh, and in terms of the discontinuity, sometimes it might be also a good thing. Um, I would I would think in terms of like uh, left politics or left tradition or left activism and how. Uh, our generation was probably not that much engaged because either the dream was achieved or was lost or semi or okay. So I, I see a discontinuity there. But on the other side, like these recent uh, movements, I think they have given uh, voice or stimulated the interest or have engaged people that they come from none of those traditions. And this is, I find, like a very fertile ground and very. Uh, fortunate moment, maybe possibly, hopefully, for something new to be created. In the sense also of institutions, but in the sense of uh, it, even reinventing those institutions. And I think it was, uh, Michael, before that you uh, pointed out this insistence on democracy at the moment that is, uh, it's, a, it's a discredited uh, yeah. notion. Uh, so, uh, Maybe in the process of like uh, keeping or uh, restructuring or what we have, we also give uh, birth to something new and on that. Yes, I, I want to say a lot, so I'm going to try to be as uh, compact as possible. First of all, uh, on uh, the political economy and the relation or the relationship between economics and politics, uh, I don't. I I think that politics can't be reduced to, pol uh, to economics. That, that, and there is a distinction. We should keep that in mind. On the other hand, I absolutely know that people are deeply concerned about injustice, exploitation, uh, uh, impoverishment, and that that brings people who otherwise are different together. But working on that, their, uh, overcoming their differences to address some common problem, whether it is with a dictatorship or an unjust economic system is actually something that we need to pay attention to. But it, it's the reduction that, that worries me, not the understanding that people can have uh, economic concerns that really motivate them and then they get become citizens with distinct identities. I didn't want to say that it's only about identity, that it was once about interests, then it was about identities, now it's publics. Actually, what I want to say is that we've been enriching what it means to be in social movement and become more and more aware of the fact that we have to take into account you know, structural injustice, uh, the development of uh, our imagined identities and our self-definition, and working on cultivating what has been called here the commons. I think the cultivation of the commons uh, 
as a matter of social movement practice um, it is uh, something noteworthy and that we shouldn't ignore it. On the other hand, I don't want to just celebrate it, say how great we are. But uh, I think it's very, very important not to uh, uh, um, overlook what one has accomplished because we are always in between. And in order to imagine a more desirable future, um, uh, one moment, you know, after the park has been emptied or after um, uh, a strike has been um, um, overwhelmed by uh, the militia, um, uh, you, you have to then think what goes on next. But we're always in between. And the problem of continuity and generations, that's part of the human condition. You know, that's, that's simply part of the human condition. That the next gen and it's for good and for bad. It's very good people forget what we know because that opens up their their imagination. So so um, you know continuity yes, but not as the only thing that's important. Now as far as the new school and oh, the continuity yeah, of the new school. Now I'm, I'm, now I'm going to engage in some shameless self promotion. Uh, uh, I have just started a, a new blog online magazine that is the, the, the blog online magazine of the greater New School community. That means students, faculty, alumni, and colleagues, people who are concerned about these issues. Uh, one of the magical things about the, the web is that we can actually con constitute a collective memory and, and reconnect generations and um, you know publicseminar.org is it <laughs> thank you uh, thank you very much Jeff yeah. and Spina and Michael thank you very much <laughs> and John John is gonna uh, do the final remarks thank you very much Everybody, um, I'm John Vanderlip from the New School. I just wanted to say thank you to everybody. I want to thank the conference organizers, the panel organizers, all of our panelists, and everybody who's been here, and all of you for joining this conversation. It's been extremely educational for me. I've learned a lot. Now I also know who it was that asked uh, John Dewey and Charles Beard to come down here and start the New School, apparently. So <clears throat> I think Sorry. that there have been a number of themes that have emerged here that are important, and I think it's important to carry on with the theme that's come out of this one here, which is this question of continuity, continuing the conversation about building a new society, a new future of equality, justice, freedom, and democracy. And so let's continue the conversation here at the new school and at your own institutions. Um, Giz and Eoras, and you can see uh, the, the various websites here on the poster uh, places. And so I've been telling them now it's supposed to cut. Okay, the Tuesday meetings. Okay, so Tuesday meetings have been con going on since early June here in this room at the new school, and they will continue every Tuesday for the rest of this semester, right? Seven weeks? Six weeks? Okay. Um, and hopefully into the spring, we'll see. So please join us. And again, I thank you very much for being here, and good luck to everybody. <laughs>